It's 10 o'clock. It's time to start the bookworm. Um, believe it or not, we're already in the 16th episode of the bookworm. So I'm excited. Excited to have you all here. So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Angela Unk, Director of Development at the Clements Library. Uh, just a quick reminder that the, this broadcast is being recorded today to share online later, and you'll as, receive an email later with the recording and any, um, any resources that we discuss in today's broadcast. I just want to give everybody a quick tutorial. Um, you've already started using the chat function. That's great. Please chime in and continue the conversation there. If you'll be so kind as to select all panelists and attendees, that helps to make sure that we can all see what you're saying. And you'll notice that the conversation goes by very quickly. Uh, my colleagues Ann Bennington Helber and Tracy Palevich are online to help monitor the chat and to paste in uh, information along the way. If you have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you have a specific question today, please type that into the Q&A section. You'll see that you can also give it a little thumbs up that gives it an upvote so that it goes to the top of the queue. So if you see something that people are asking that you're also wondering about, you can do that. The answers can be typed in and posted with the questions as well, or we'll answer them live. If you have an additional comment to that question, please feel free to type it in there so we keep all of that information together. If you're just signing on now, you'll notice that we have a poll in progress before we start today's broadcast while everyone was signing in. We started talking about um, photographing some of the iconic Upper Peninsula images. So feel free to participate in that and we'll be closing that up in just a couple of moments. In addition, depending on what device you're looking, um, you're watching this from, you do have some options. I can control some of the things that you see, but you'll want to test out some of those options as well. I've enabled side-by-side -side mode, so right now you should be able to see the, um, the slides beside the speaker and drag uh, the divider between those two to come up with the size that you like best. Um, also, you can choose uh, speaker view versus gallery view. So if you'd like to see just the person who's speaking or if you'd like to see all, the, all of the panelists. Also, you'll see that Ann and Tracy are on as panelists but not sharing their video. So you can choose to turn off the people um, hide non-video participants. So I just encourage you to uh, take a moment. I, I tried at one point in time giving more specific information until I realized that everybody has slightly different, um, a slightly different view depending on what kind of device you're on. So I hope that uh, you can figure that out and come up with a way to watch it that works for you. All right, this program is brought to you by the William L. Clements Library on the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. The Clements Library enables the discovery, learning, and teaching of American history through the collection, conservation, digitization, and availability of primary sources on paper. So um, we're very happy to have you with us today. Today's episode is generously sponsored by Clements Library Associate Art Acton. Um, some of you may have seen um, Art when he was on the program a couple of weeks ago. So thank you very much, Art. We really appreciate your sponsorship today. All right. 
last chance to participate in the poll. So hurry up and click away. And I'm going to go ahead and close it up. Um, let's see. There we go. End polling, share results. And as I'm sure we all suspected, the Mackinac Bridge is the most photographed of the, of the UP sites. 68% said that they've photographed the Mackinac Bridge with picture drops coming in second with 42%, Quamanon Falls at 55%, ooh, tied with Lake Superior at 55%. And those of you, the 15% that haven't been to the UP after this talk, even though we're looking at historical images, I think you'll still be inspired. So um, it's, a, it's a great place to uh, see some amazing scenery. All right. close out of that. Okay. Today, Clayton Lewis, our curator of graphics at the Clements Library, will be hosting a conversation with collector Jack Dio. Clayton oversees the Clements collection of historical prints, photographs, artwork, illustrated sheet music, and other visual materials. Clayton has authored numerous articles and has curated exhibits on vernacular photography, early racial satire, popular and patriotic music, wartime art, and American leisure travel. So thank you so much, Clayton, for being here today. And I'll let you take it away and introduce Jack. Thanks, Angela. I've been very much looking forward to this session. Uh, one of the things that I enjoy most about this job is just having the chance to talk to collectors like Jack and share our enthusiasm for for these materials. And uh, uh, I miss the opportunities uh, to do this. Uh, so welcome, Jack. I'm good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Um, greetings from the Upper Peninsula, Marquette, Michigan. And thank you for uh, having me join this uh, incredible uh, bookworm series. Thank you. Happy to have you. So, Jack, I understand that you have credited your love for history and photography with growing up in Dearborn, Michigan, near the Henry Ford Museum, and that you took photography classes in high school in the 60s, and then color photography at Henry Ford Community College, back when photography meant chemicals in dark rooms. You then graduated from Northern Michigan University in 1975 and opened up Superior View Photography up in Marquette. And since then, you have been collecting thousands of negatives and photographs and presenting them on your website, viewsofthepast.com, which now has over 15,000 vintage photos available. Uh, Jack, your photographic work we know has appeared in art shows all over Michigan. Uh, your wildlife pictures have earned many awards and have been in publications, books, magazines, and documentaries. Um, I know Jack has got an incredible collection of early Michigan photographs, and he's also become an expert in how photography links to Northern Michigan history. Uh, Jack will share with us some examples from his collection that represent his favorite Michigan photographers, including George Shiras, the pioneer wildlife photographer and inventor of the trail cam. So there's so much more I could say, but Jack, what else can you tell us about your, your collecting interests broadly? Well, it hasn't stopped, unfortunately. Those darn stereo cards keep coming up on eBay. I thought I've seen every one BF Child's ever shot, but every time I look on eBay, oh my gosh, there goes my wallet. You know how collectors are. We just can't stop. It's a compulsion. <laughs> so yeah, I'm still collecting, but uh, not quite as hard as I used to. I used to advertise in uh, like the action shoppers that I collected cameras and negatives and uh, I, I kind of just stopped doing that. I, I have no more room in my studio. The last time you visited, we could walk through it. Now the floor is covered, Clayton. So I got to stop sometime, I guess, but it's the stereo cards. I can't stop. Yeah, there's a, and you know, growing up in Dearborn, that's Lee Bartlett. He was a science teacher. That's the courtyard of Ford High School in West Dearborn. And of course, uh, 
Greenfield Village was right in my backyard and all my neighbors worked at Greenfield Village. So I never had to pay to go there. And actually my next door neighbor was the tin typist. So we'll talk about that in, a, in another minute here, but that's Lee Bartlett and in 1969, uh, I took his photography class. Now he's a science teacher. Uh, now today, photography is mainly uh, part of the arts curriculum. But back then it was a science class. And we actually learned to mix our own chemicals, our dectol and fixers from scratch, where we uh, measured out the chemicals and all that. So this man changed my life. And I, I always give my talks crediting arts in the schools and how if it wasn't for this guy, we wouldn't be talking here today. Um, we had a whole classroom that could be darkened for printing, but we also had a dark room where we could load our own film. We, we bulk loaded our own 35 millimeter film. So that turned me on right off the bat uh, to photography. I, I was always, I always had a camera, but I was never knew about the miracle of a dark room and uh, watching uh, an enlarger print. But what, what's interesting is I didn't know at the time what camera he's got there. That is a Linhoff Technica, probably one of the finest four by five cameras ever made. It has Schneider lenses. About 12 years later, when I started collecting cameras, a lady called me up and she had two of those. Her husband just passed away and he was a Kodak rep. He gave lectures on Kodak, how to develop. And I got all his slides and cassette tapes. That was the Kodak manual to teach photography that came with two of these cameras. And for 30 years, I copied everything I could get my hands on four by five uh, film with that camera. So I didn't know he was using a Linhoff back then, but 12 years later, I owned two of those cameras. But that's Lee Bartlett. High quality equipment for a high school class. Huh? Yeah, yeah, he was amazing. I mean, I ended up being uh, on the school newspaper, uh, photographer for the Bolt. That was the Etzel Ford High School newspaper. So he, he really changed my life. So this is also 1969. And uh, my niece was born the day they landed on the moon. So my brother brought her over to have her photo taken with me and my new, uh, I don't know if it's a Zenite or a Zenite Russian 35 millimeter camera. And you reminded me that you had one, Clayton, which blew my mind. I never knew anybody that had one. I bought it from uh, Big George's uh, Home Appliance Mart back when they had a camera department here in Ann Arbor. Um, Big George's. Uh, my, my, mine was a camera store in Dearborn. I don't know if it was Adres or, or where, but I think it was less than $100. So that's all I could afford as a 10th grader uh, in 1969. But the, it was a single lens reflex, which means you're looking right through the lens, which is what everybody wanted. But the shutter was so bulky and, and loud that every time you took a picture, you hear this clunk, 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 but it did the job. Uh, and a neighbor gave me that tripod. Now that tripod's made for like an eight by 10 or a movie camera, but I was so excited to take pictures of my niece that I used the tripod back then. But I ended up having a dark room in my mom's laundry room starting in 1969. When I went to college, I used my dorm bathroom. In every house I ever lived in, I had a dark room. So, uh, in fact, I bought a Durst and Larger in 1969. I was so into photography uh, from my high school instructor. But yeah, that's me, 1969. And you'll see the difference in about 10 years later on the next slide. <laughs> Now, there I am with one of the Child's Art Gallery cameras. In 1978, I acquired the Child's Art Gallery, and that's one of their field cameras. And that's how this whole thing started. I was just looking for an old camera to do old time portraits. It tell was us real big bit, and, Tell us a little bit about uh, Brainard Childs for, for, for those that aren't familiar with him. Well, we got a picture of him coming up. So I'll, I'll tell you quite a bit about him in a minute. But this is how Greenfield Village affected me. I wanted to do tintypes. Greenfield Village did an original tintype, but it had potassium cyanide, and they had to have ventilation at Greenfield Village. Well, Elbinger and Son, in 1971, a company came out with a tintype that you could shoot uh, without all those hassles, and that's what I started with, and then I later moved into Polaroid, but uh, yeah, that's one of the child's uh, cameras. I ended up getting all their studio cameras, which are like 10 times the size of that camera. And I still have those today. But that's me 10 years later, a little bit of the hair change. You know, this. <laughs> everybody had long hair in the 70s, I think. But I think the next shot might be Mr. Childs. This is uh, Brainerd Fremont Childs. 
Uh, he came to Marquette from Vermont. He was actually in the Civil War from Vermont and got turned on by photography right at the Civil War. And he actually worked in a couple Eastern galleries before he came to Marquette. But in my mind, and probably a lot of collectors will agree with me, he was the most prolific photographer in Upper Michigan. Uh, he first worked with Brubaker, who was in Houghton, because Marquette burned down in 1868. The year he got here, Marquette had a fire. So he went to Houghton, and then later moved uh, back to Marquette and opened a studio, which ran for 110 years, 1868 to 1978, when I got the negatives out. And what I like about this photo is that you can see the artistic skills of a photographer. A lot of the early photographers were artists who took up photography to better their art or, or learn more about art. And you can see he, he was making his advertising sign for his stereo views. Uh, and he circumvented Lake Superior in 1870 with a Mackinac boat and uh, a, an Ojibwe guide showing him the safe harbors to stop at. And he photographed all the way around the lake, all the mines. Uh, I'm still seeing cards today I've never seen after 42 years. And I've seen the Tinder collection, the Len Wally collection, uh, the Michigan Tech collection. I've been to the Minnesota Historical Society to see their collection. And I'm still finding cards I've never seen after 42 years. So very prolific photographer, um, but that's B.F. Childs. And we're gonna see more of his stuff coming up here. Oh, there's my man, Dave Tinder. Yeah, in our previous conversations, uh, our our mutual friend Dave Tinder came up quite a bit, and uh, yeah, yeah, his, his collection is is uh, focused on Michigan history and is now at the Clements Library. But you know, Dave, quite a ways back uh, from when you well, bought the child's of uh, equipment. Is that right? What? When I got the collection in 1978, I just wrote a letter to the Michigan Photographic Historical Society and I just said to whom it may concern because I didn't know anybody in the group. And about a week later, I had a phone call from Dave. And about another week later, he flew to Marquette to see what the heck I just bought. And uh, this was the beginning of an amazing relationship that lasted many years. Uh, Dave was a big influence on my collecting and uh, he shared many photos with me that I put on four by five film. Of course, I had to trade away something good to get those, but that's how Dave worked. Uh, you know, I, I didn't tell you a story once. He came to the UP and I took him to an antique shop over in Champion, Michigan. And I'd already, I'd already been in there, you know, I, I'd gone through there. Well, he found a beautiful frame, Child's Art Gallery shot of some miners behind the desk there. And he talked about that for the next 20 years that he found something <laughs> under my nose that I took him to, but Dave, Dave was amazing. And we're gonna talk about six photographers today. They're all in his directory too. Um, and even a few more that work for Childs, uh, Frederick Hafer, Christian Brubaker, all worked at Childs Art Gallery and they're all in his, uh, uh, his directory, which is one of the greatest tools for geneal genealogy. You know, you can date old photographs from going to Dave's collection and seeing when photographers were operating. So I can't say enough about this collection. And of course you did the editing of it, Clayton, and it's one of the greatest tools out there. So I'm glad you put up Dave's picture. We had a, we had a proofreading team from the Michigan Photographic Historical Society that, that went through the directory uh, before publication. I'm very grateful for that. God, it's huge. It's huge. It's amazing. So <clears throat> I've turned myself back on to interrupt for just a moment. I don't know, Jack, something, I know we tested it, but we're still getting a lot of static or something from your microphone. So what if I do that, take it down and not put it on my neck. I think that sounds better. So does that sound better? It does. Let's try it and okay. see. Let's try it this way. I took it off my neck. Okay. Okay, we'll see. Now quit wiggling. <laughs> I'm glad you can hear me though. Um, these are what we're talking about. These are stereo cards. These are all by Childs. Um, he later put out a series called The Gems of Lake Superior. Uh, but in the beginning on these yellow mount cards, uh, these are the earliest you'll find. In fact, those yellow mount cards are all Houghton scenes because he was up in Houghton for um, a couple of years before I moved to Marquette. But when you're collecting uh, stereo cards by B.F. Childs, the yellow mounts are the oldest then your orange mounts. 
And then in the early 1900s, they put out these gray mount cards. Um, and it's funny, when I bought out the studio, I had boxes of these cards that were never sold. They were mint. And when Dave came up, he had never seen a gray mount card. And of course, I didn't know anything but those. And so he educated me right away about orange mount cards. And of course, I got a lot of them off of him over the years. But that's what we're talking about. Those are stereo cards. And I do have a stereo camera, in case you don't realize that a stereo camera had two lenses. Uh, can you see the? This is a little glass plate stereo camera made in France, but it has two lenses and at the same time it's taken shots about the same distance as your eyes. And when you look at these, you see three dimensionally. And I give slideshows today in 3D. That's why I actively still seek out these cards because I can take you back in time by giving you a 3D slideshow. But that's the, those are stereo cards by Childs right there. These are glass plate negatives. Um, the top two are ones we're gonna see the prints later. Uh, they're dry plates. But the bottom two are child's wet plate negatives, which I ended up getting uh, uh, quite a few of these. And the thing about a stereo negative is that you have almost an identical side-by-side -side photograph. Uh, so when these things were, were sold over the years, they cut them in half. And you'll see in some collections, like at Michigan Tech, they only have a half of it. And uh, like you see the one on the left is one that's cut in half. And the one on the right is a full stereo shot. But these are wet plates. They had to be sensitized on the site that the photographer, he had to have his chemicals and he had to sensitize all this. And uh, by about 1880, the dry plate came out. Uh, so you're gonna see pictures from these negatives when we go a little further here. That's the one we just saw, the Miner's Castle at Pictured Rocks, one of the most favorite places for photographers to shoot. But this is the entire glass plate uh, that I scanned in. And uh, you can see the two of Child's assistants sitting on a rock there and uh, his Ojibwe guide uh, leaning at the bottom against a tree. But I have a shot that shows you the clarity of an 1860 wet plate negative. When you blow this up, you see that he's not holding a spyglass. He's just holding a, a, a piece of wood with a little knot on the end of it. And the man sitting on the, the uh, rock is Charles Cole. He was Ard Emery's brother-in-law. Ard Emery is another uh, amazing photographer from Marquette who shot stereo views. And he met Giles in 1868. And he started working with Childs and, and worked in photography in the UP till 1931. So Char, uh, Charles Cole is almost as important as uh, B.F. Childs. He was his partner and then took over the studio. And he's the one who won an award at the World's Fair in 1904 for photography. But look at the clarity of an 1860 wet plate when you blow it up. So, so my understanding, Jack, is that what we're seeing right now is an enlargement that is about an inch square on the original negative, maybe, yeah, maybe yeah. smaller than that? Yeah, yeah, it's just a tiny little piece of it. In fact, I said yesterday, I'm, I'm seeing the emulsion uh, cracking in front of the guy standing there, a little bit of the hairline cracks in the emulsion. But, you know, talk about an ASA or a, a film speed. It's just amazing how big and sharp these blow up. And I used to put these negatives right in the enlarger. I printed directly from these plates for many years. But now with digital, uh, I can get even a better result. Like you said, even the background comes out. Sometimes you wouldn't see the background. But yeah, you're right. It's just a portion of that negative. Now this is the other plate. And I've cleaned it up. You know, when there's a rip or a tear or a spot, I've removed it. Uh, but I love this shot for several reasons. It shows how big the camera was that Childs was using. Uh, it was a wet plate camera. You can see his shadow in the bottom right of the photo. And uh, the cannon uh, sat in Marquette Harbor to guard the ore dock during the Civil War. So if you can imagine, uh, we, were, we were worried about the war coming this far north. We were guarding the ore dock, which was making iron for, the, uh, for all the armaments of the war. But that's Ripley's Rock. They're still sitting in Marquette. There's still an ore dock there today. But just, you know, the, the composition and the beauty of every picture Giles took is just noteworthy. You can see old fish shacks in the harbor and 
the old ore docks. So that's one of my favorite photos. Is this a scan from the negative? Yep, yep, that's the glass plate put on my Epson scanner. And like I said, I've gotten rid of some of the little dust spots and things that have happened over the years. Uh, if, you, if you saw the original negative, there was a lot of damage in it, but uh, this is what I ended up getting. Now, I used to have a stereo card of this um, that I copied. Uh, later, I found in my collection the original negative, so it's even better now. This is one of my favorite uh, Michigan views, I think. And there's so much information in it. In addition to the, to the ore dock, you know, out in the distance, you can see that one of those vessels is fully loaded and riding low, and the other one yeah. is is riding high and hasn't been filled up yet from the right, ocean. Right. And then and we were talking about yesterday, this, the dock aimed uh, almost due east, right, from the shore. And the shadows line up with that, which makes me think that this was probably taken right around the time of the equinox. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. It, and of course, if it was the spring equinox in uh, Marquette, that harbor would be filled with ice. So, so it has to be. So this was the, the fall equinox. So there's so much information in these pictures that you can ferret out uh, right. for various purposes. And for those of you who don't know, we were one of the first to have a pocket dock in Marquette. In 1857, they got the idea of using a pocket dock. So this is 1870. 1857, the first dock was built in Marquette. So yeah, great history. This is my uh, next photographer I chose. He's the Calumet photographer, John William Nera. Uh, he operated from about 1900 to 1917. And uh, up on Bootjack Road in Calumet, uh, all his negatives were in an old barn. And I was lucky to acquire the collection. This is a, a celluloid, uh, kind of from a, a folding Kodak camera. I got all his personal negatives too. So I figured his wife took this caught him with his eyes closed, which I, he probably didn't like. But I think I told you the story about those pictures in the back. Uh, when I went down to see Dave Kinder, uh, after I got this collection, he had all those pictures in his, in his room. And uh, it turns out that he had people up in Calumet that were picking for him. First time I ever heard the word pickers. And uh, Dave had those photographs. Now, if Dave would have asked for the negatives, I would have never gotten this collection, but he wasn't collecting negatives. I was because I was a photographer who wanted the negative. So that's J.W. Nera, John William Nera. Uh, that his descendants just uh, started the Nera Nature Preserve, donated all this land to the city of Houghton. And when you come into Houghton, you'll see the, the, the Nera Nature Preserve uh, that's still there today. So amazing family and amazing history. I think there's another shot that Dave blew my mind with. Uh, when I saw the next photograph, uh, he, he was just giggling about this. It's an advertisement with a woman totally covered in photographs. And uh, oh, I'm probably making my noise again here. I'll hold on to it. So Dave had this card and uh, he let me copy it. This is not from the original negative, but uh, like I said, D Dave got around everywhere and that's how we know his collection got so big. But what a cool shot for uh, Anira. But yeah, he was known for his, for the Italian Hall disaster, mainly in 1913. Uh, being a Finnish uh, photographer, he got in with a lot of the, uh, the strikers and it took a lot of intimate shots of the Italian Hall disaster. This is during the strikes. This is a glass plate uh, with kind of the anti-socialist uh, group. Um, so this is no red flag for us. And you can just see the clarity. That's why I picked these glass plates, the sharpness, the faces of the children are just amazing. One of the things I noticed about Nera's prints in, the, in Dave Tinder's collection is how well they've lasted. Like uh, some photographers' prints fade and maybe, they, maybe their chemistry wasn't as strong. Oh yeah, prints yeah. Always beautiful and in tremendous condition. I think, yeah. I think he was very meticulous about his methodology in the darkroom. He had good fixer. You have to have good fixer. And there's other photographers. One is uh, Whitesides, uh, Brubaker and Whitesides. Everything Whitesides photographed that I have is faded. And again, it's probably because, you know, you had to fix it. You had to make it permanent. But yeah, you're right. But that's in Calumet. You see some of the old Calumet mine buildings in the background. And uh, 
And, and this negative, when I got the collection, I was driving home looking at some of them in my car. And I almost went off the road when I held this one up because uh, it's just so amazing. And it's dated 1904 because I found other photographs of the dancing bears that came to Calumet in 1904. But this one amazes me because those kids are so close to that bear. I mean, one swipe and he'd wipe out a whole row of children there. But that's a glass plate. It's about four by five inches. And uh, Nera did shoot the Italian Hall disaster. All the, you know, it was a horrible thing. 74 people, mainly children, died of suffocation in a stairway. And he marketed them in stereo cards, but they weren't 3D. But stereo was so popular that he could sell more cards and pictures that way. But uh, I didn't put any of the Italian Hall in there, but I have all the negatives of that too. But yeah, I love the shot, dancing bear. That's a Russian uh, bear and a, probably a Russian trainer too. Uh, I picked another Marquette photographer, and he was around a long time, 1880, according to Tinder, to 1927. So Gustav Werner, a uh, German, uh, had a studio in Marquette, and uh, he also shot stereo. Uh, but I ended up getting his negatives from the Ishpeming branch. He had a portrait studio in Ishpeming, too. But this is the back of his stereo cards. And uh, people wonder where I got the name Superior View. Well, this is on almost every old photo you see taken in the UP, Superior Views. So that's where I got my name. But Werner was a great photographer. Um, of course, a lot of portraits of, of people, but this is one of my favorites. And uh, I actually had this photograph. It was old, yellow, and ripped. And I made copies of it and was selling it. And then somebody walked into my studio with this glass plate negative. They found it in a drawer in the uh, First National Bank of Marquette and gave it to me. And look at this. This is 4th of July, 1885 in Marquette. And all the ships put up their flags. And again, if you blow this up, you can read the names off those flags of these ships. It's so sharp and clear. But this is a great shot of what we call Iron Bay. Iron Bay is the name Marquette's Bay was given because of all the iron uh, activity. Uh, another glass plate by Werner is the shipwreck of the Moonlight in Kent. This is out on the beach of Chocolay, Lakewood Lane. Marquette's in the background. You can see the old Hotel Superior, one of the biggest luxury hotels that used to be in Marquette is sticking up on the hillside. But these boats were being pulled by the Kershaw. Uh, a steamship was pulling these when the storm hit and they cut these boats loose and they just uh, ended up on the shore out in uh, uh, Harvey. But the Kershaw had to be rescued. One of the most dramatic rescues on the lake and the Houghton life-saving crew had to come 90 miles by train to rescue these men. And after that, Marquette got its own life-saving crew. They weren't at the mercy of Houghton coming so far to make rescues. But I just love the competition or the uh, composition, the fact these men are standing on the uh, boat. And again, you can read the ship. It's the Henry Kent in the moonlight. They sat there for almost a year. I got pictures in the snow of these ships too. And I'm sure everybody in town came out to take pictures too. And Werner took this photograph. Uh, oh, I see you put up a little uh, thing about it. That's great. This is probably the largest selling photograph ever taken in Michigan. Because in 1893, G.A. Werner copyrighted this photo. He took three shots, a front view, a side view, and a three quarter view. And at the World's Fair in 1893, they sold 10,000 copies of this shot. Well, I've sold hundreds of it myself, and I put it on a postcard and sold 10,000 postcards. So I have to think this is the greatest shot uh, or seller ever taken. And I mentioned that it was the definitive story was in Michigan history back in uh, 2012, January, February edition of Michigan history has the whole story of this load of logs. And it's fascinating because they took it by train to Chicago. And then every day at the World's Fair, they loaded and unloaded this for people to watch those horses pull those logs up. So I had to show you the Werner uh, World's Fair load of logs photo. Uh, I also chose another glass plate collection. And these 
guys are also in the Tinder collection. This is uh, Adolph Peterson, uh, who had a, a studio in Gwynn, Michigan, 1907 to 1927. Oh, no, I'm sorry, to uh, 1921. Um, they used the tent to travel in to take portraits, it, like, like a giant skylight. And I have many shots taken in this tent. But they also had a beautiful brick studio in Gwynn, Michigan. Gwynn was a model town built just by the mine company, CCI. They found iron there and built the town. The famous uh, landscape architect, Warren Manning, uh, uh, laid the town out, did all the planning. But these guys ended up with the Peterson Block. They had a movie theater, they had a candy store, they had a photography business, and they went all the way to Menominee. This is the Menominee and Marinette Light and Traction Company uh, to photograph a dam being built in the early 1900s called the Rapids Dam. And this glass plate is just so sharp and clear to see the workers and their tools. But when they shot the dam, uh, like in a lot of early photographs, everybody came out to have their picture taken. And if you look closely at this photograph, you see 20 men posing for the camera, which is very typical when a photographer went to take a photograph. But all the way from Gwynn to Menominee, they photographed every town on the way, the depots, the, the buildings. Um, but this one still has the damage in the sky. I just scanned this one a few weeks ago. I, I never even got to it. 40 years I've had it. But you'll see the scratches and the marks in the sky, which I will remove. Uh, if somebody's going to use this in a book or want to print, they don't want the marks in the sky that happened over the years. So I, I just put this in here as an example of what you can clone those marks right out of there. But that's a great shot of the dam being built. Every stage of it was photographed. And he took this one of the, the children of the loggers, uh, and it just kind of uh, touches me to see these children in front of what would be a tar paper shack, I guess. And uh, But, you know, they, they were in a chair probably built by their father. Look at that chair. You know, that's pretty neat. So that's one of the shots he took while he was in Menominee of the, the children of the loggers there. And another photographer that who's negatives, this is Theodore Sexton. And uh, this is kind of one of the last big negative collections I got, I think about eight years ago. But he's holding a contact print frame. Um, a contact print frame is what they actually printed in. This is, uh, the back would open up and you could put your negative and your paper right in this frame. And this is an eight by 10. In fact, this is the shot we were just looking at with the, the, the ships in the harbor. Uh, but Dave Tinder had these all over his wall. He picked these up as frames and I had a hundred of these. So when I got home from seeing Dave the first time, guess what I did? I started putting all my photos in these for display purposes. But that's what he's holding in that picture that we just showed of Sexton. Um, Sexton operated from 1905 to 1918 in Garden, Michigan. Garden's right by Fayette. It's on Lake Michigan and, and Big Baby Knock. And uh, uh, his glass plates were mainly of logging camps and the logging industry. This was taken in Vans Harbor. This is a glass plate as they're loading up a lumber schooner with the wood. And it's just amazing to see this so sharp and clear. The man standing there who's doing the, the number counting with his little book and the men who pose for the photograph of uh, a, a lumber schooner in Vans Harbor. Here's a couple other uh, sexton pictures I picked out. Um, the apple industry. It was a fruit growing place too. All kinds of farms are growing fruit in Garden, Michigan. Garden's kind of got the, the climate for growing. But this was a postcard. And this is the original negative. So when he printed it, all those words on the bottom would come out on the postcard. And it tells you where it is and what it is. But just an interesting shot of a whole different industry. You usually see mining and logging in the UP, but this is uh, growing fruit. And then I picked a, oh, this is a, a typical shot. He, he covered a lot of the baseball. In fact, he photographed a whole baseball game on glass plates. People hitting, people sliding in the base. But he would, he would shoot the teams like this is the Fayette baseball team. But again, I just love the clarity of a glass negative. 
And then I picked one more that Dave Tinder used to talk about. Dave had this original photograph. And when I got the negative collection, uh, he told me about this. The men have these numbers written on the bottoms of their shoes. And maybe somebody out there has a good guess of why or what they mean, but I still don't know why one foot says 11 and one says 11 and a half. But uh, Sexton shot a lot in the saloons and the bars and lumberjacks uh, relaxing after work. And that's what we see here. And then finally, uh, George Shiras III, you know, in Marquette, everything has the name Shiras on it. There's Shiras Planetarium, Shiras Steam Plant, Shiras Hill, Shiras Park. I never knew what that name meant till I started collecting and realized that the father of wildlife photography was from Marquette and did his work in Marquette. Uh, actually at Whitefish Bay, which is really in Elger County, but he was a, a lawyer from Pittsburgh and his family started coming here, his grandfather in 1849. Marquette was founded in 49. He was coming here just to fish, his grandfather. And every year since he came, his, uh, his son came and then George came from 1872 till when he died in the 1940s. He came to Marquette every summer to take wildlife photos. In the background is John Hammer, his guide of 45 years, who patented and built a lot of this camera equipment. He is shining a light on a deer as he sneaks up on it, and then he lets a big flash go off. And uh, that's how we took some of the amazing photographs. And he was also a naturalist and a conservationist, good friend of Teddy Roosevelt, and just an amazing story. I have a few artifacts I'll show here after we see the pictures, but this is Innocence Abroad, probably his most famous photo he ever took um, of uh, two fawns and their mother. This was shown in Paris in 1900 at the World's Fair, and it stunned the world. Uh, newspapers from all over the world were writing about this photograph. In fact, he wasn't entered in the photography division, but the photography judges gave him a special medal for photography, even though he was in, I think, the natural science category of the World's Fair. But um, he became one of the most prolific wildlife photographers. Uh, I think the next shot is of his price book, it came out in 1901, and he picked 10 of his famous photographs that appeared in uh, Paris, and he marketed them in three different sizes. The small ones were $1.50, and the real large ones, like 20 by 24 inches, were $5 a piece. And today, if you can find these amazing wildlife photographs, they're highly collectible. Uh, but this is one of the only price books that's in, ex in existence. And it tells the story of each photo, when he took it, what year it was. But uh, just a famous, you can talk an hour just on Shiras, maybe two hours on Shiras. I don't know if there's any more in there. Oh, well, like I said, he was a, a conservationist. And he's responsible for the Migratory Bird Act that came out in 1916. He initiated it years earlier, but it took this long to pass it. And it stopped hunters from shooting birds any time of year on their nests. Hunters were wiping out ducks and geese by the thousands. And he realized that. And this is a stamp that came out in 1966 when it was 50 year anniversary. And uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty was celebrated. And then a uh, hundred years after it came out, there was a big celebration in Marquette and I was asked to play George Shiras. So here's Jack as George. Uh, I put on a little fake mustache. I found a hat like he wore and I played Shiras many times, even back when I was in my twenties. Uh, I did a, a 30 minute documentary where I actually used his equipment and flashed it out in the lake. I have that video tail off to show it to you sometime, Clayton, but I just thought I'd throw this one in here to, uh, to show you how I looked in, uh, this would have been 2016. But I did bring his original first camera trap. Uh, this would be set out in the woods where a deer was going to cross a trail. And cameras operated with thematic shutters operated by a squeeze bulb. So you'd put the squeeze bulb in this trap, and when a deer came by, it would trip this and squeeze the bulb and set off the camera. This is the first trail cam in the world, bar none. 
He later got more sophisticated with flashes and cameras that would take two or three photos at one time because the deer would react to the flash. They'd be in midair and he could take a picture of them while they're floating in midair. But um, this was in my museum for many years and I, I get to have it to lecture with and talk about. And then in 1935, he wrote a two volume set of books called Hunting Wildlife with Camera and Flashlight. This is the first edition 1935 book. It was actually his wife, Frances Shiras's copy. Frances Shiras was the daughter of Peter White. Anybody who knows Marquette history, Peter White is one of the founders of Marquette. So here's one of the biggest families of Marquette merging with the Pittsburgh Shiras family. And today their money is still endowing the city of Marquette. The Shiras Institute and the Shiras Fund is still giving thousands of dollars away years later uh, from the work of this man. But this was his book that came out in 1935 amazing book to read if you can find it at a used bookstore and then just recently camera hunter came out this is the definitive book of george shiras by a northern michigan professor uh, james mccommons just research years of the shiras history and this just came out this year so anybody who wants to read more about shiras you want to pick up camera hunter or go back to the 1935 books but you know shiras is just an amazing story Jack, can you tell us a little bit about what's on the wall behind you? Um, well, let's see. Actually, right behind me is Mr. Nera's first sign, advertising sign. It's an oil painted sign on stretch canvas. And when I bought out the collection, this was sitting uh, with the negatives. Uh, and there was a dead mouse in the corner of it, which I always remember having to shake the dead mouse out of it. But, you know, I have Nera's original sign hanging up here behind me. But I think you can also see a couple of the Shiras prints. Um, here's Innocence Abroad right here. Um, and I think over here is Hark. I don't know if you can see it, but a wolf howled right as he was taking the photograph. So the deer looked off to hear the wolf howling and he shot this incredible photo. Now National Geographic never had photographs back then. And when Shira started putting his photograph back in the turn of the century, half the board of Geographic resigned. They didn't want photographs in National Geographic. So it's a great story how George Shiras made National Geographic a photo magazine. But when the books came out in 1935, National Geographic issued that picture, Hark, and Innocence Abroad, and, and sold them and put them available through Geographic. So those are easy to find. You can find those reprints from 1935. But the original 1898s uh, are a little harder to find. You can't really see the other ones up here, but I have a porcupine chewing a tree. And uh, my other one is a lynx, uh, a Canadian lynx that is posing with a reflection in the water. And to think he shot these in 1890 without telephoto lenses, without modern equipment, is, it's a mind boggle. And then the big thing behind me I put up just to tease you, Clayton, is a bird's eye view of Marquette I just acquired in 1872, uh, drawn by H.H. H. Bailey who went around the country doing bird's eye views. And that's Marquette Iron Bay in 1872. So um, I just acquired that from a man who showed it to me 40 years ago to tease me. And when he passed away this year at age uh, 92, he, uh, he left this to me. So kind of an amazing story, but I put that in there to tease you. But that's what's behind me. Thank you, Jack. Sure. Yes, thank you. Oh my gosh, that was so amazing. And um, we, I'm, I'm blown away, even though I had already seen those photos, if they, the clarity and um, the artistry are just fantastic. So thank you so much for sharing all of that and all of your wonderful knowledge with us. Thank so you. I just you're want, welcome. you're welcome, thanks. Um, I just want to remind everybody, we will answer questions, so please put your questions in the Q&A section. And I'm just going to do a couple of housekeeping slides while um, people think about their questions and add them in there, and then we'll get to, right to them. Um, 
Next week, please join us as we host uh, Brian Lusky to talk about his book, Min is Cheap. Uh, Dyke Benjamin and Clemens director Paul Erickson will be talking with Brian um, and they'll be talking about business and labor history and the book and it should be a really interesting conversation. So join us next week for that. As a reminder, if you're new to the bookworm, once you sign up, you are signed up for the series unless you decide um, to unsubscribe and you'll receive a reminder next week with the login information. And if you're unable to join us live, you will still receive the email with the recording and the resources later in the day on Friday. You can also check out previous recordings on our website and um, we look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, as you know, we began the bookworm uh, to keep in contact and we're just delighted that so many people have joined us. If you already support the Clements, we thank you very much. And if you are moved to uh, support the Clements, we'll provide a link in the chat for you to do so. All right, well, without further ado, please keep adding your questions to the Q&A section and we'll go ahead and start answering those now. All right. Are you, I see you marked some, Clayton. Do you want to lead the way? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I saw one that was just posted that asked about when the first daguerreotypes were taken in Michigan. This is a question coming from Richard Benjamin. Um, I know Dave Tinder in his directory cites a newspaper advertisement in a Detroit newspaper in the fall of 1841 of somebody who was unnamed that was taking portrait daguerreotypes in a hotel room in Detroit. Um, and Jack, I know we've talked about uh, a, a long lost daguerreotype of Marquette that was taken very early on that was mentioned in a newspaper that no one's ever seen the whereabouts of the photo. Uh, well, I knew that it was a daguerreotype taken of the Sioux locks being built uh, in 1850, and I think it was at the uh, Greenfield Village or the Henry Ford Museum, I saw that one. But I think the earliest photographers in the UP doing daguerreotypes were in the Sioux but in the 1850s. But the one about Marquette, I, I'm not sure I'm up on that one. There was a daguerreotype, oh, it, taken of Marquette from a boat. The very first photo of Marquette yes. was taken from uh, a boat of somebody going up to the Copper Country. And it showed uh, the actual first forge that was in Marquette. But yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know where it is. Maybe Len's got it. Len Wally, do you have that one? <laughs> <laughs> the, the ones you mentioned are the Sioux Locks, I think are at the Getty Museum in California. Um, oh, are they? They're, okay. yeah. Um, and uh, I think they could, they're, the locks are without water. I think it's before they, while they were mm -hmm. under construction, before they flooded them for the first time. Well, you remember I said my next door neighbor was the tintypist. Well, he took me into the back room of the Henry Ford Museum back in the 1970s, and he showed me a daguerreotype of the Sioux Locks. So I don't know what the Henry Ford has archived there, but we might want to ask him again, because I swear I saw that in 1979 or 1980. But yeah, they, they have quite a collection there, you know, at the Henry Ford. But yeah, 1840s is the earliest in Detroit, right? Cool. Lost your audio, Clayton. I'm back, thank you. you As a photographer, Jack, you've taken film photography, you've done a lot of digital work. There's a question that's been asked, do, do you think anything is lost with the digital photography? Uh, no, I don't because uh, you know, it's just an amazing thing. Everybody's taking pictures now and you don't have to buy film and pay for processing and the result and the manipulation are so amazing. But what's lost is that 
people aren't making prints. They're relying on the cloud or they're relying on a jump drive uh, to hold everything. And nobody gets around to printing and making albums anymore. So that's kind of the big problem is that you're not getting a print back. Uh, if you want to print, you got to print one or take it to Walgreens or whatever. And a lot of people don't do that. I, I know my daughter's got thousands of photos, but she has no prints, you know. So I, I tell them, it, somebody will say, all my pictures are on the CD-ROM. And I think, wow, I could break it in half and you don't have a collection anymore. So don't purge your originals is what I tell people. If you still have a slide and you scanned it, don't throw the slide away because who knows in 50 years what we'll be looking at and how we'll be looking at photographs. So I always say don't purge the negative or the print that you have, even though you digitized it. But I love the digital world. I love it. <laughs> I certainly love the ability to uh, spontaneously take pictures without worrying about the cost of the film or running out of film. I mean, I, yeah. I, shooting out of car windows and things like that is something that is that I very much enjoy that you just couldn't easily do in the film days. Well, in the beginning, I shot a lot of weddings. And you know the pressure when you shoot a wedding, but you don't know if they turn out till you get it back from the lab? Well, at a wedding now, these guys know they got it the minute they took it. And that's a big relief off them. But I used to sweat weddings. <laughs> yeah, so there's a difference there. The immediate uh, look at the photo is a great thing. So here's a question from uh, Dan Friedis. Jack, do you think including the shadow was on purpose? Um, and this must be referring to the, the child's view of Marquette. Seems odd given that the composition is so careful. Yeah, no, I, I think I, he could have cropped that out. He saw what he was going to shoot from the back of his ground glass in that camera. He's under a hood. He sees every inch of that before he puts his plate in. So that's a good question. No, I think it was on purpose that he could see his shadow. And as, like I said, it's the only shot I have of him with his camera. There's no pictures of him holding a camera or taking a photo. There is a picture of, of his dark tent up in uh, Calumet when he was shooting the copper mines. Uh, there's a stereo card. I wasn't able to get it on eBay. It went too high, but it shows his dark tent that he had to have with him. But that's, that's the only shot of him and his camera as a shadow. But I think it was intentional. There's a lot of good questions here. I don't think we're going to be able to get to anyone. Uh, Barbara Prince is asking about your museum. And I'm presuming that this is, uh, this is ref you were referring to your shop in Marquette when you had displays of your equipment and collections. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I closed that down in 2007. I also had a Mackinac store. I think that's where I first met you, Clayton. You came up to Mackinac City and toured my shop, which would have been in 2006. So I think we've known each other 14 years, which is kind of mind boggling. Uh, but I still have an outlet in downtown Marquette called Art of Framing. When I moved, when I closed my studio, I moved my whole collection of images and displays right across the street to another store that's featuring them still today. And they take in all my copy and restoration work. I still do copy and restoration. I, st I still work uh, uh, in a little bit of photography, but all my pictures are on display in downtown Marquette still today. And people can order or I meet them there if they need to talk to me. But yeah, after 35 years, I closed my Marquette shop down and I was in Mackinac City for 10 years. So nice to be out of retail. That was hard. <laughs> Here's a question, Jack, uh, from Lois Stenger. I have a postcard of the Sulox by Alan Fonjoy. Have you heard of him? <laughs> Oh, yeah. 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 I have some. Uh, is it? I think it's Fanjoy. F-A-N-J-O-Y. Did she write Fan or Fan? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure of the spelling, but, uh, I but think he's it's a well-known well Sioux photographer. I think he's in the Tinder directory. So if she goes to the alphabet and looks up Fanjoy, I think he's in there. I'm pretty sure he was a pretty uh, active photographer. But yeah, I have a few of his images. Yeah. Here's a question from uh, Feng Li, who says, you mentioned the use of smartphones quite often for photography. 
Uh, what if it dissatisfies you? And how is smartphone photography impacting the study of photographic history now that almost everyone is a photographer? I think it's great. You know, look how it's changing the world socially, too, and with all these uh, uh, events being caught on camera recently. It, it's changed the world, and, and I think it's a good thing. I mean, everybody's got a camera, and you go on Facebook now, and you see just amazing views by everybody who maybe they didn't appreciate photography till the iPhone came out or these uh, portable cameras, but uh, no, I, I think it's a wonderful thing, and I think it's only helped photography. Um, some amazing shots are taken with those cameras. They're high in megapixels. Uh, you know, they're, they're amazing. I've blown up stuff from my camera 20 by 24 from my phone and uh, they still hold up. So like I said, we're not spending all that money on processing and you can easily delete all your bad ones. Delete, delete, delete. <laughs> I have to do that just to save memory on my computer. I think I have 30,000 on my laptop. So I got to get rid of some once in a while, but that's how many sit on my laptop and my phone, 30,000 shots. Tom Wagner asked about the shutter speeds that gave sharp pictures of the wildlife. Do you know anything about uh, Shiris's shutter speeds? Yeah, he actually uh, started off with a camera that wasn't adequate and he ended up using what's called the Schmidt detective camera, uh, people that collect cameras, or you can Google that and see that this camera had one of the first fast shutters. Uh, it was a, called a detective camera because you could sneak around with it and take a picture uh, of, of people. And uh, I would think it would be like a 30th of a second, maybe even a little faster. But you know, when you talk about child shooting wet plates of people in boats in the locks, uh, or in the uh, Whitefish Rapids in 1870. And on his stereo cards, it says instantaneous view. So he was getting shutter speeds of probably a 30th of a second or 15th of a second or 60th, even back in the wet plate era. So uh, shutter speeds started getting fast even in child's day. But by the time Shiros was shooting, he had no problem with shutter speeds. Len Wally is, says hello and is asking about your neighbor, the tin typist at Greenfield Village. Who was it? Uh, his name was Tim Fluharty. Uh, and Tim ended up moving out east. In fact, he was, uh, oh, I forget what, industrial mill town in uh, Massachusetts, I think he was working for. But he was started at Greenfield Village. Almost all my neighbors worked there. But uh, the tin type, and I have pictures of Tim sensitizing plates at Greenfield Village. I sat many times to have a real tintype taken. These were real tintypes he was doing. So I, I have a whole series of uh, Tim working at Greenfield Village, but all my neighbor, one neighbor ran the print shop and we'd go there and see how they printed. And uh, so, and then my dad, when he retired, my dad worked there 10 years as a, a guard at the Henry Ford Museum. So like I said, that's what influenced me knowing and loving history, but uh, uh, that, that's who it was, Len. Timothy Fluharty, F-L-U-H-A-R-T-Y. Uh, he was my next door neighbor. And uh, that, that was a, a good influence on me. Tom Wagner also asked about preserving old prints. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a difficult question to yeah. answer, but, but in general, if you have old photographs, keeping them in the dark, keeping them dry and away from uh, humidity that could cause mold and, and the breaking down of the paper, and, and also uh, keeping them cool. Uh, uh, photographs survive the longest in cool, dry, dark rooms, and, uh, and uh, that's something that's pretty easy to achieve. Uh, beyond that, the cleaning and restoration of photographs can get to be a, a complicated science and highly specialized. Um, do you do any of that work yourself of uh, photographic conservation of the physical photos? Uh, well, yeah, every, uh, once I scan a negative, I put it in an acid-free envelope. So the, the 15,000 images that are on my website are all in acid-free envelopes. So that's one way to preserve them. I run three dehumidifiers 24 seven. I have to dump water out of my studio almost every other day and it's not even a very wet place, but I run three dehumidifiers 
So my electric bill is very high to keep my collection from getting moist or damp. Uh, and I do actually still have some things in my basement. That's where I got two of them running because the basement's a little more damp. But yeah, I run dehumidifiers. I use acid-free envelopes. Uh, and everything that I try to, to keep stored, like you said, cool and dry. And uh, when you do have an old photograph on the wall, they have UV protecting glass that keeps the UV light from hitting your photo. So uh, when I have a real precious image, I'll use UV glass if I'm going to display it. We have a question from uh, Elizabeth Colvin about a photographer, William Harold from Ironwood. Um, and she has an undated photograph of her grandfather that has the photographer's name and location, uh, thinking the photo was taken around 1905. Um, um, he should also be in the Tinder directory. I think Dave goes up to what, uh, the 1920s. He kind of quit putting photographers in there. So if he was a professional and he advertised it all, I bet he's in the Tinder directory. Now, I've never heard of that name, but uh, just as an example, the little town of Nagani, Michigan, at the turn of the century, had 25 photographers, professional. Uh, even a woman photographer in the 1860s was out of Nagani, Michigan. So uh, many, many photographers uh, were in the UP, but she should look at the Tinder directory, which is a free PDF to download and look at. It's great. So that's an interesting question, Jack. What, so many photographers in the UP, was that directly related to the mining boom and the lumbering yeah. boom? Yeah, yeah. of course, Nagani was the birthplace of the iron industry and uh, Ishbeming. Now, Child's Art Gallery opened uh, in Marquette in 1870. But in 1880, 10 years later, they opened their Ishbeming branch. And it was the largest phot photographic studio north of Chicago. It had the largest skylight. It could hold a whole graduating class of, uh, you know, 50 people could pose under the skylight. So Ishbeming was almost as big as Marquette in 1880. So yeah, a lot of the photographers followed the mines. Uh, it's like Houghton, Calumet, Copper Mines, and then uh, Nagani, Ishbeming, and Marquette. Yeah, and you know, the, lo the logging industry to some point too, but it was mainly mining that made these towns flourish. So who was buying these photographs in the 19th century? Everybody wanted their picture taken. This was new to them. A lot of them never had their photo taken before. 1880 might have been the first time they ever posed for a picture. So it was hot. You know, everybody wanted one. Uh, if you look at how many people posed at Child's Art Gallery, I have some of their early ledgers and it's page after page. And the same people would come back several times in a year and bring the kids for a shot or just a husband and wife. And I think it was the novelty of photography that everybody had to have one if you could afford it. Um, but yeah, that's what I, I claim it to. Do you think the, the photos of the mines that people like Childs were taking, were those bought locally or do you? No, you know, all it was Eastern backers. Uh, everybody, all the mine owners, uh, like CCI, uh, the Cleveland Cliffs Iron, that was Cleveland. Uh, but a lot of Marquette was all Massachusetts. Uh, all the uh, people who put their money in the mines. So the stereo cards sold out East. And I think I told you in the last month, so many of these child's cards have been on eBay. And the back of the card says Stafford. Well, Stafford was a Marquette founder from Massachusetts. And now these cards are coming out of Massachusetts. A lot of the great, and it's the same with Shiras. You know, Shiras from, was from Pittsburgh and that's where a lot of his photos ended up um, in uh, Pennsylvania. But out East, all the mine backers wanted pictures of the mine. So I think most people were buying them from other areas. How are we doing on time, Angela? Um, we still have a lot of participants interested in the, uh, the answers to the questions, so I don't know. Okay. Uh, if we have a couple more, we certainly could. Um, yeah, there's a question, Jack. The difference between ectochrome and kodachrome. You've shot both. <laughs> of those, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, ectochrome you could develop yourself. Kodachrome you couldn't. Kodachrome had to be sent to Kodak. And of course, Kodachrome came in a couple different uh, film speeds, ASAs. I think the lowest was 25. 
Uh, so when you shot Kodachrome 25, you got a color rich slide. Uh, and I still have slides today from the 1930s that are perfect. You know, they don't fade, uh, but ectochromes you could develop with an E6 process. Uh, it was difficult. You had to have temperature controls within one or two degrees. And I did that for a while. I've actually printed photos from slides using unicolor. Maybe you remember the unicolor process, but you can print your own photos and it was a pain in the butt. Because uh, of the chemistry, you had to have so many thermometers to keep everything. But that was the difference. Kodachrome had to be sent to Kodak. Um, and ectochromes you could do yourself. Did you find there was a difference in the color quality? I always preferred the Kodachrome myself. Oh, yeah. Kodachrome was rich. Red reds and dark greens. Uh, but ectochrome, you know, ectochrome had a faster speed, too. If I was going to shoot something uh, sport-wise or where there's motion, I used the highest uh, ASA ectochromes. Um, I forget how fast they It's been a while since I've shot slide film, but that class I took at Henry Ford Community College was just on slides. And, of course, I've been giving slideshows ever since. I gave slideshows in college. I still give slideshows regularly in Marquette. Uh, but now it's digital. I still have to haul around this big digital projector, but, uh, but yeah, that's the difference. Kodachromes were amazing. So color photography historically c comes very late in the game, like true color yeah. photography uh, appears around the turn of the century. Um, <laughs> what yeah. are the earliest color photos of the UP that you're aware of? Um, you know, again, I think, well, when, when the 1930s, when the, when the slide film started coming out and color film was a little more prevalent, but um, this other collector from Marquette named Don Balmer, he's a member of the Michigan Photographic Historical Society, has one of the first color cameras. In its turn of the century, and it used a filter system of, of lenses, I, I can't recall the name of the camera, but like you said, they were doing it even in the early turn of the century where they were using different filters uh, and they put these all together to make a color photograph. But m mostly if you see a color image earlier, it was hand tinted. A lot of people colorized using uh, Marshall photo oils. They go back to the 1920s, actually early 1900s where people colored them. But, you know, I'm not really an expert on the birth of color photography, but I know, oh, it's a, called an Ives chromoscope. Uh, I think is this camera that Don has. One of the rarest cameras you can collect and it's sitting up here in Marquette right now, but it's a color camera from the early 1900s. So nice. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah, but slides, they hold up, you know, a slide, when people bring me a slide and I scan them, they, they rarely fade. It would have to be in the projector with a light on for hours to hurt them. And they were never really given to the light other than in a projector. So slides are a good thing to have. Well, I think we answered most of the questions and um, it's been delightful. What a wonderful way to spend a morning. Thank you so oh, much. Good. Matt. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, yeah, great I'm, questions. And we could go all day, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I still had stuff I didn't show. I forgot to hold up. So. Oh, what do you oh, got? Oh, what do you have? Uh, you know, I brought the actual box that went around Lake Superior in 1870. This is the actual wet plate negative box. So you can imagine B.F. Childs held this many times, probably Charles Cole did too, but it had a light proof top to it. So he could take the picture, put it in here and develop it later. It was light sensitive, 1860. And I'll even pull out one of the original glass stereo wet plates uh, that is in here. It's a picture of the pictured rock shot through the cliffs. And you can imagine, 1870, this was taken. And it's still in the original box. Uh, I think you have one of these in your collection via Dave Tinder. But it, who, have, and he got it from you, is that correct? He had to have one of these. Oh, of yeah. course. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we all love Childs. I think uh, Len and Gene Wally have a huge Childs collection. Uh, his stereo cards are, again, so collectible. But yeah, I, I didn't show that. And I also so had the that, Can I ask? So yeah. when you say that he could develop it later, what was the time frame? How long could he leave it in the box? Well, he, he had to sensitize the plate in a dark tent, load up his film holder, and take the photo while it was still 
wet in the camera. It had to still be a fresh image. He could then put it in this box and it's preserved until he can get to where he's going to develop the plate. But you had to shoot it while it was freshly wet and sensitized. But then, you know, this has a light proof lid. So I deduct the fact that he could have a sensitized plate in here and have it protected from the light. But yeah, you couldn't really develop the plates on, in the field because you're out there in a mine field or mine shafts. And uh, so that's what this is. It's a light proof negative box from, and it still has, it says pictured rocks on it. And it has the child's sticker Child's Art Gallery, Artistic Photography, and Fine Picture Framing, Ishpeming, Michigan. So this ended up in Ishpeming when they opened the 1880 studio. I had about a dozen of these boxes. And of course, Dave got a good one, and I have the rest of them. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, very that's cool. They can I develop had, it later. I had seen, Clayton, that Mary Beth had put that as something for just the panelists wondering about the dark tent and how did you develop with no running water and chemicals, so. One more thing I'll show you is the bronze medal from the World's Fair of 1904, uh, won by the Child's Art Gallery. This was the box it was in, but this was given to them. And at that same World's Fair in 1904, Shiras won the gold medal. So here's two photographers from the UP stunning the world with their images. This medal was given for mining photography in 1904. Uh, and Charles Cole would have been the photographer who took it. But uh, yeah, I had that sitting here too. I forgot to hold it up. So a couple more goodies. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you. Nice, uh, a, a nice treat for everybody who stayed on until the end. So yeah, good. At which there are lots of people on. So thank you, everybody. Oh, for thank you, everybody spending time with us this morning and thanks again Jack and Clayton and everybody have a great weekend. Yeah beautiful summer day. Thank you everybody. Good yeah. to see you Bye -bye. Jack. See you, Clayton. Bye Angela. Bye. Bye.